Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalists. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we post a video every week on a Friday, so do hit subscribe if you want to know what we're doing every week. Yes, and don't forget our Monday Shorts. If you've got a question you'd like to ask me, pop it in the comments section below and we'll get round to using it on our Monday Shorts. We will do our very best. And Stephen, our very best today. It's a beautiful midwinter's day, yeah. feeling the chill. Yes, it's quite cool, but that sun is quite nice when you catch it. So uh, it's nice to be out and about in the garden. It is, and it's reminding me of sunnier climes. Yeah. Early in the year, we were at the wonderful Burnley Gardens. Yes, we've done a few videos about Burnley and and it is certainly a wonderful asset to Victoria mm. to have that beautiful garden in suburban Melbourne. Yeah, it's a teaching garden, um, but also it's just free to wander around. And it's, yeah. I think, on a par with the Melbourne Botanic Gardens in terms of the variety and the beauty of plants. But it's also a teaching garden. It was fabulous. But what were we doing there this particular sunny day, Stephen? All right. Well, we went to visit some trees that we thought were of particular merit or interest. So we selected five interesting specimens around the Burnley Gardens and I want to talk about them. Okay, well <laughs> you can Stephen, mm. let's go and have a look. Well Stephen, I've stopped here and it is not, well here in Australia, the world's rarest tree. No. It's the Moreton Bay fig tree. Yes, Ficus macrophylla. But, and it is fabulous oh, though. And where's it native to? All right, well it's native from central Queensland right down to um, New South Wales southern coast so quite a broad band of habitat. It is such a beautiful tree. Now growing up in England as I did The Jungle Book was one of my first feature films I remember seeing. Mm -hmm. This tree screams jungle to me. Yes yeah, I get that it sort of does although I would have said uh, more rainforest than jungle uh, well, where guess. this comes from but anyhow of course ficus is a huge genus there's masses and masses of them which includes the commercial fig also one of my favorites mm. and this particular one is loved by bats and birds and everything else around uh, and grows into an enormous canopy tree mm. never a sort of really sort of single trunky sort of tree as a rule uh, and of course it ends up with these enormous buttress roots that go out everywhere yeah. and quite regularly aerial roots that come down from the main limbs and branches and there's one prepared earlier. Mm. Mm. It is a glorious tree and comparatively hardy so my mum used to live in the southwest of Western Australia which gets yeah. regularly sub-zero sub 32 degrees oh, um, yes. Fahrenheit temperatures and frosts and near her house was a, a much larger older property and they had the most enormous Morton Bay fig mm. in the front garden which was planted when the house was built in the 1880s so it had managed to survive in what you'd say is a relatively cool almost cold climate in Australia. Yes I'm, I'm not sure that it's quite <coughs> for the gardens of London yet <laughs> but but nonetheless it's also it, a big tree yeah well it is a very big tree but certainly it's one of the hardier figs and it certainly makes a fabulous tree mm. if you've got the right spot for it I mean in a park or garden of some size it makes a very impressive tree but because of its buttress roots and things that it sends out, uh, it's not always a very convenient tree. You know, it's hard to mow around, things like that. So you've got to, you've got to consider how you use a Morton Bay fig. So this one is planted on the edge of a border and it's kind of become almost like the retaining wall. Of it has indeed. It's a, it's a remarkable effect. Yeah, a stunning tree. One of the many beautiful trees in this garden, not wildly uncommon mm. or rare, but a great thing to see living its best life. Yes, and sometimes it's about the individual, not so much the, the batch of a plant. So an individual can stand out on its own. There you go. Well, there's one just around the corner that I think you want to do. Oh, yes. Let's go have a look at my favourite tree. OK. <laughs> now we're standing in front of a tree that I particularly like. Uh, not that I've got room for one in my garden, I have to say, but this is the Queensland Kauri. So this is Agathus robusta, uh, one of I don't know, about a dozen to 14 species, all Southern Hemisphere, all conifers, all don't look like conifers particularly. Uh, and this is a remarkable specimen. So it's on the National Trust uh, Tree Register uh, as an important individual specimen. And this probably dates back well to the early parts of this garden's uh, development. And it is a truly remarkable specimen. And we saw another one, probably the similar vintage in the Melbourne Botanic Garden. Oh, yes. So we'll link that video. Yes, we did. And as you're walking up, just it is just the most incredible, the trunk and the bark. Yeah, it is. It's just beautiful. Yes, it would turn even the most jaded into a tree hugger. So a, a bit of sort of care and conditions then. 
it's much further south than its native range. Oh yes, yes, because this comes from the mountains up in uh, northern Queensland. So it comes from quite tropical climes. It's surprisingly drought tolerant and also comparatively cold tolerant. Mm. But having said that, as a young tree, it will not cope with you know heavy frosts of more than a, a degree or two. So mm. it's not for uh, those really cold climates, unfortunately. Yeah. What a beautiful tree. It is, it's stunning. and. If only the person who planted this tree could come back now and see what an incredible specimen they actually started. Well, there you go. That is the whole thing about planting trees, is that you kind of got to have that imagination and the foresight, 3D future imagination to see what yes. it's going to look like. Well, of course you do. And you've got to plant trees for the next generation and the generation after that. So it's really important that we're all out there doing that. We are. Well, here we are standing in front of a border with a tree in the background, which does knock your socks off a bit. It's a brachychiton, so one of the bottle tree family. Brachychiton bidwillii in one of its forms, they come in sort of pinks to reds. And we've hit it at a time of the year when it's in bloom. And Matthew, you might have noticed that there's a couple of branches there with leaves on. Yeah. The ones with leaves on have no flowers. Yeah. So it only sheds its foliage on the section of the tree that's going to flower. And interesting, I mean, we're end of summer now yeah. and everything's kind of, just you know peak blousiness and some things yeah. are going over that doesn't look healthy though yeah because it's, well, it's, it's, it's got no leaves on it in the middle so of summer. Much, yeah. yeah it's lost so yeah. much leaves it's something one has to get used to but i have to say some of the brachychitons are just spectacular rainforest trees mm. uh, that one comes from uh, queensland down to almost the border of uh, new south wales yeah uh, along the coastal strip uh, and it is a truly spectacular tree and that's got to be quite some years old it's so beautiful mm. the flowers are incredible and we did come across one of those too in the melbourne oh, no, the system the yeah university garden yeah, yeah university garden at the system garden stunning uh, and it is it's a really beautiful tree. so just to clarify it drops its leaves before it flowers and yeah then it at the time it's again. about to and yeah. then once the flowers are finished it will then leaf out again so it's not sort of deciduous in the classic sense no no it's not because it drops its leaves in the middle of summer usually so there you Odd, go but mm. stunning in bloom all right yeah. on to the next all right well that brachychiton i think is one of the most spectacular I've seen. It's a beautiful tree. Yeah. A wonderful form, and it stands out superbly in the back of that border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the agathis, your, one of your pet fetishes, Stephen, yeah. tropical conifers. I adore them. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, I don't have a garden that is climatically suitable for some of them, mm. uh, and also not big enough for some of them. You're squeezing a few tropical conifers in here, though. Oh, yes. I've got the old ones hiding around the place, mm. and I'll probably be well dead before they be become a problem so I'm not going to be worried about what they might do in due course. Well what they might do in due course is interesting because one of the people that we met at Burnley is the wonderful, um, I don't know if he's the lead arborist but he's an arborist yeah. attached there, Matt Sovereign and we made a video with Matt about tree care but while we were talking off camera he said oh there's these two dreadful trees that never do anything and I said oh what are they Matt? Well yeah. Stephen it was funny as we were walking around because Matt did point out these two trees and said how disappointing they always are because they're never in bloom. And I said, but wait, yes. I'm going to drop in now a picture I took here in 2022, so a few years ago, when they were covered in the most beautiful blossom. You do have to be here at the right time, though. They are what I would call barometer plants. As mm. soon as they come into flower, the wind picks up. <laughs> so, and what are they? Well, they're actually weeping flowering apricots, so oh. weeping forms of Prunus mumae. And it is a very well thought of small weeping tree, but it needs a lot of management because it only flowers on the new wood. So unless you prune it back each year, oh. and you can see where these have been pruned back, and now you've got all that long water shoot growth, yeah. that's where the flowers will be next late winter on those branches so to have the whole plant flowering well you need to prune it quite regularly otherwise you end up with a skirt of flowers lying on the ground and all unflowering wood up above oh well now we know but matt i'm here to say they have bloomed beautifully when i've been here well there you go yeah it's nice to be able to prove people wrong isn't it so there you are. So even the in-house arborist sometimes gets it wrong because yeah. those trees, when I saw them, were the most spectacular things I'd ever seen. Yeah. Well, uh, it is a pretty spectacular plant in bloom. It um, is. But as I said, you've got to manage them well. So one of the concepts, the adult concept, that Matt introduced us to was this notion of formative pruning. Yes. In fact, I think it's something that we should all learn about. Yeah. Uh, and I have made my mistakes over the years. It's the forgotten art of... 
improving your tree's structure for the long term. Right. The question here is to prune or not to prune. Yeah, because you've got <laughs> multiple, well, you've got the original leader that the tree had when it first went in, and now you've got a fairly strong secondary leader coming up here and another one on the far side and a baby one down here. How would you respond to this? You know, if you had these in a, a row um, along a driveway or yeah, something. Sort of as an avenue plant. Avenue, maybe you'd want to prune them up so you could see the stem and you'd drive down an avenue, see beautiful stems and beautiful crowns. Right. But in a park setting like this, I say, why prune? Let's let these lower branches, which they are, the yeah. lower branches, they're attached to the stem. They're yeah, not, so they're from not the actually base. suckers from no, the roots. They're yeah. from the they're actual mm. branches. Um, why not let them grow and um, change the form of this one for a park setting that can become multi, multi trunked? Well, Stephen, I don't want to rub salt in the wounds, but yeah. we are here for a reason. Now, we're in your orchard, yeah. and you are leaning very graciously yes. upon this tree here. Yes. So, firstly, what is this tree? Right, well, this is a Dutch meddler. Most people would know it as Mespilis germanica, mm -hmm. but uh, the powers that be have decided to lump it in with hawthorns. So, right. it's now Crataegus uh, instead of Mespilis. Mm. And... It's a fabulous ancient fruit tree. Yeah. I love them. The fruit's lovely. The autumn foliage is great. The um, blossom is beautiful. And the form of the tree can be rather lovely, but it's a small spready tree and it grows into gnarled and interesting old age. Mm. But what I didn't do mm. uh, when I planted this tree was make sure that I got the canopy up high enough. Mm. And now I'm in the position where I have got some rather substantial low limbs on this tree. And if mm. I were to remove them, two things are likely to happen. One is that I'll get a lot of water shoot growth that will come up off the trunk from around where the, um, the cut would be made, mm. which is not a good thing because it will be this sort of strappy stuff that will go all over the yeah, place. And look weird. And look weird. And also I would end up with a rather stilted tree because the next level of branches up are quite high. Mm. So I'd end up with this tall trunk uh, with a fairly small head on the top of it so now, unfortunately, due to lack of formative pruning, um, you now have to duck on a regular basis when you walk into the orchard. So what do you think you should have done with this tree when, it, when you first planted it? All right, well, when it was a younger tree, I should have taken those lower limbs off when they were quite small. Mm. Uh, apart from the fact that um, they're easier to deal with when they're little. Mm, they which leave, was Matt's point. Yeah, and that, but they leave less of a scar. They're not so inclined to uh, encourage disease into the tree. Uh, they're not so inclined to produce water shoot growth, which goes off in all sorts of directions. And I probably would have got some slightly higher branches that I could have trained from just to lift that canopy up that little mm, bit more. Mm. So I, I hesitate even uh, arguing with my partner about this over the years, about still doing it, um, uh, mainly just for the sanity of not losing your brain because you get hit it on the tree all the time. There you go. Well, formative pruning. Yep. We can all learn from that. Yes, we can indeed. <laughs> okay, let's go and look at some more fabulous trees at Burnley though. Oh, Stephen. Oh, it's about time you found me somewhere to sit down, I have oh, to say. Oh, my goodness. We've been <laughs> schlepping around this garden. I must say, though, it is so beautiful. Oh, it is. It's great. Mm. Great place to visit. And I am so pleased to be sitting under this tree. It's uh, an arbutus, mm. and we did do a video specifically on the genus, so yeah. you could probably go back in and have a look at that if you wish to do so. And this one's a really interesting one. This is arbutus andracnoides which is a hybrid strawberry tree, which has been found in the wild, so it, it can be a natural hybrid, mm. but it's been found multitudes of times. And some of the individuals of this hybrid sort of are a little more like one parent or a little bit like the other parent. Mm. So it's not a static looking hybrid, it's dynamic, <laughs> uh, due to the fact that it reoccurs time and time again. It's a cross between what we in this country would rather weirdly call the Irish strawberry tree, uh, Arbutus unido, uh, and the Grecian strawberry tree. And I say weirdly uh, with Irish strawberry tree because there's a small colony of it in Ireland that's thought to be natural, but it extends right through Spain all over the place. The, the term Irish strawberry tree, you get laughed at if you go to Spain and say, oh, it's an Irish strawberry tree. Like English oak? Yes, well, it's all over Europe as Which well. Which is all over Europe and all over Britain, not yeah. just England. Yeah, so anyhow, uh, common names are what they are. Yeah. Uh, so Yes, yeah, common and somewhat misleading sometimes. But this has ex 
exquisitely beautiful bark, mm. mainly inherited from the Grecian parent. Grecian good looks. Yes, it's exactly. It's got that wonderful look about it. The Irish strawberry tree, as we call it, Unido, tends to have a rough brown bark of no particular particular merit. Mm. The tree itself can grow into a beautiful gnarly tree, but this hybrid is just lovely. It's stunning. The bark is exquisite, and I must say, in our horticultural journey, bark never really figured in my imagination yeah. in terms of placement of a plant or considering it as a choice. But yes. um, obviously, the more you get attuned to it, the more you see the place that bark oh, yeah. really has in the garden. And if it happens to be a beautifully formed and shaped and sculptural tree at the same time, mm. what could be better? Yeah, what could be better? Yeah, so there we go. Arbutus andracnoides. There we go. Now I know the Morton Bay fig is not particularly rare, no. but I love it as a tree. And in fact, I did see some um, in Miami when I was there earlier in the year. They are in subtropical and tropical parts of the world all over. They've mm. become a very popular and important tree in large parks and gardens. Yeah. But it does need to be a large park or garden. It does need to be large. <laughs> it's a massive tree. Now, we sat under that Arbutus and enjoyed our time there. Yeah. And it wasn't until a a couple of weeks later, I was talking to somebody from Burnley, and it turns out that that tree was probably planted by one of the previous professors there mm. um, and purchased from me. Steve and Ryan, your fingers are right <laughs> for everything. <laughs> oh, I, I have to say they probably are. So um, uh, it dates back to the sort of uh, early 1980s, so it would have been not long after I first started my nursery. Yeah, so... There's some trees in Burnley that I probably supply well, as well. Right. You've always had a thing for arbutus. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're well, they're a wonderful group of trees. Yeah. They're drought tolerant, they're heat tolerant, they're pretty cold tolerant. Mm. Uh, they're beautiful trees. Uh, they're of a moderate size so that they can be used in general yeah. gardens. Yeah. So I think they've got a lot going for them. There you go. Well, there's a lot going for Burnley. Uh, we'll put the website links below. Uh, there's a Friends Association too, so you can find out anything that they're hosting. It's free to go yeah. and it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, so go and visit Burnley. Yes, visit Burnley. And if you want to study there, you can as well. It's part of the Melbourne University campus. But Stephen, what might we be studying next week? Well, we could be going anywhere. Um, so it could be anywhere, anytime, and it could even be somewhere else in the world. Goodness me. To find out, you'll have to hit subscribe because we post every week on a Friday. Yes, and don't forget our Monday shorts. So if you've got a question you'd like to ask me, pop it in the comments section below and we'll get round to using it on Mondays. We will indeed. But until then, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye all.